Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. Um, but also today we are interviewing the incredible Ricardo Spagni, uh, otherwise known as Fluffy Pony, uh, discussing the use of blockchain technology in Hong Kong, uh, crypto's recent developments in China, and much more. Uh, so stick around to hear the news. Um, and Ricardo, before I ask how you're doing, I'll give you a, a quick introduction uh, of, of you to our audience. Um, so Ricardo, I've known, otherwise known as Fluffy Pony Online, is the former lead maintainer of Monero, uh, co-founder of Tari Labs, inventor and co-founder of Yat, or Y.at, um, and as per his very own Twitter, is the director of Dull Sculleries at the Institute for Lemonade Studies. Uh, how are you doing today? How's things going? I'm, I'm great, and uh, really, thank you for having me. I just, I'd like to point out that you know my role as director of uh, Dull Sculleries is clearly the most important one out of everything I've done. I, I can only agree. I don't think anyone would disagree with that statement. <laughs> but no, uh, we're glad to have you and appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today, I really do. Um, and uh, other Ricardo and Jerry, how are you guys doing today? I'm doing great. Um, how are you doing, Lawrence? Yeah, not so bad. In the UK, we, we had some sun for a few hours today and you know, it, was, it was a surprise, I must say, after this month's terrible, wet, rainy season. Uh, how about you, Jerry? How's things going? um i feel great um not really you know my mood seems to you know shift with the bitcoin price so <laughs> i'm feeling down basically oh man well hopefully we can pick you up um and hopefully we can pick up the bitcoin price i mean i don't think we do influence it very much but looks like things are on the up in the last two hours so you never know um, but yeah, I was, I was editing earlier and I was just like making a video or whatever. And I just saw it just dropping. I was like, oh, oh well, another day in the office. <laughs> I just don't care at this point. But um, yes. Yeah, so, well, as I say, we'll, we'll get straight into the pod um, and we'll kick it off. So um, yeah, uh, to kick us all into gear, we'll, we'll discuss uh, some of the news that has cropped up this week. And we're going to avoid the basic obvious stuff like PayPal's intentions and things like that. Um, but yeah, so uh, Ricardo, you had a news piece you wanted to bring up um, about, I think, China. Uh, but yeah, go ahead and, and let us know what it was. Yeah, sure. Uh, this one's from Business Insider India. It's called China's Crypto Crackdown Intensifies. After Inner Mongolia, Sichuan energy regulators are probing crypto mining. So a few days ago, Chinese authorities um, decided to start clamping down on companies that are running mining operations in Inner Mongolia. And they announced like fines and stuff like that for um, the company's punishments for those that are non-compliant. And now they are moving these operations to crack down on the mining companies to the mining companies that are in Sichuan. Um, I think both regions have a lot of cheap hydroelectric energy from the dam projects that China has been setting up for their infrastructure. So um, this is primarily where the mining operations and the large uh, mining pools are concentrated. And um, now that they're moving to Sichuan, uh, we're going to see if this has like a further impact on price action or hash rate and stuff like that. Uh, what do you guys think about China cracking down on miners finally? It's been rumored for years, but it seems like it's finally taking place. Well, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, as you said, it's been rumored for a long time. Um, and it's it's one of those things that uh, I always kind of, it kind of seems like it, it was just inevitable, really, uh, with the CCP, because they kind of want to control everything as, as the Communist Party. So I, think, I feel like the only reason it's taken this long for them to start doing anything is because they were probably making money from Bitcoin um i would expect uh but yeah it doesn't really come as a shock and to be honest yeah there may be short-term impacts but i suppose uh, the overall aim for bitcoin is to be a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer cash and obviously uh the less concentration of hash rate in china you have arguably the more decentralized the, cr the cryptocurrency becomes so yeah i think to be honest it's probably a good thing whether it it just doesn't really you know it doesn't really affect me beyond any sort of short-term price action and I so say, I don't, yeah, if China fully banned mining or something, I'm sure there'd be some people who still managed to do it. And I'm sure the miners would probably just move somewhere else. So it's not really that big a deal, I think, for me. What about you guys? Yeah, I mean, I, I think inevitability is definitely a big factor. Yeah, like every bull market, there's, oh, China burns Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, it's it's been it's been a long time coming that they, because they did clamp down previously on uh, on some mining operations. I've got a friend who um, who had a fairly large farm and they moved. They, were, they just literally 
pulled the plug, took all the equipment uh, and set up shop um, uh, elsewhere. And I think that's what we're, what we're going to see, which on the one hand is like, oh no, that's terrible because China's got such a negative attitude towards mining. But on the other hand, all of those arguments that you keep hearing about, uh, oh, mining is centralized in China. What are people going to say now? They, like, m mining is centralized in the world except China. They, they can have no arguments. Where's the Mars, Mars miner? Where's the <laughs> miner on the moon? You know? Exactly. No, I think you raised a good point. <laughs> That's pretty interesting that um, they they had a prior crackdown. I thought previously that their crackdown was mostly focused at exchanges and like uh, projects more more th more so than mining. So here's my here's my thoughts. First of all, um, I do think the timing is you know pretty suspicious. It simply it happens every time there's a, been a bull run. And second of all, I'm still not sure what the rationale behind the the you know the mining ban is. Like, what would you think would be the reason why they actually ban it? You know, mining and China, because I'm really not clear as to why they have the ban in place. Um, I mean, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, other than just because essentially they want to have control over what their citizens are doing and prevent people from. Because if you think about it, in communism, ideology, ide uh, idealistically, ideology-wise, you're supposed to be on an even playing field, right? The doctor's meant to make the same amount as the bin man who makes the same amount as the bar server, whatever. Like that's that's meant to be the idea of communism and obviously it's the Chinese communist party um, that runs the country. So I suppose part of their aims are usually to try and make sure that everyone is earning the same amount or whatever. And the Bitcoin miners aren't going to be raking in cash ideologically. You know, this is like, you know, in the perfect world in their eyes, obviously that's not the way it actually goes as we all know, but that's like, I guess, part of what they're probably trying to do there, I guess that's probably part of it. But I suppose the other thing is that I know there's like um, pressure from, outside sources like other countries in the UN, et cetera. Now, obviously, how much does China listen to those parties? Really not that much at all. But there is probably pressure on like energy consumption and like electricity generation and things like that. So potentially that's a cause, right? Like they might be thinking, shit, we need to get our, you know, uh, the amount of electricity we generate as a country down. Miners are using tons of it, even if it is renewable sources. You know, this will this will help us potentially. That's my, what they might be trying to do. But I'm just kind of plucking at uh, you know what comes to mind. I don't know for certain. I totally disagree. I think this is part of the rollout of their CBDC, their crypto yuan. Um, I think they're trying to basically corner the market and brush away other cryptocurrencies from the Chinese market so that they can kind of have a monopoly on the cryptocurrency in China. Is cryptocurrency trading actually banned right now in China? I don't think it is i'm pretty sure it's heavily I, discouraged yeah I, I i so as i as i understand it a lot of the focus is on obviously on mining but also on corporations like they they don't seem to care if users uh, or individuals rather want to own cryptocurrency sell cryptocurrency all of that which i think just speaks to the fact that um that bitcoin is something that has been designed to be to to um enable people not enable corporations so great china's just upholding that yeah i mean i i, I say i don't i don't disagree with you ricardo either um i think there's probably tons of reasons but the cbdc one's probably a pretty big one too um so yeah it makes sense um i i mean one thing i can do i because obviously tracy um being from china who works for us um i could potentially do like a spaces talk with her or we could bring on a podcast and talk about um her understanding because she might have a better insight than than any of us uh being that she's from china so uh, i'll have a word with her um but i guess uh well moving on to the next piece of news that is yeah in some way related i suppose um is a article uh where is it? i'm just gonna find the article now here we are one from the coin telegraph uh and it was uh, titled hong kong has used blockchain to save evidence of anti-authoritarian struggles um, and so essentially what they're getting at is that there's this um, blockchain based system and it's called Litecoin um, infrastructure that they've put together essentially. Um, and a lot of the Hong Kong or some of the Hong Kong uh, media platforms are using it. And what it does is it essentially puts like a unique uh, like title. It's, it's, it has the title, the author, publication date, location, etc. And it stamps these articles with a digital fingerprint. And then it saves it on their their blockchain, 
Uh, and the idea is that if the government wants to go back and alter the past in all the news articles, scrub things, kind of in that Orwellian 1984 manner of, you know, when he's like, I don't know if you've read the book or not, but he's, he's sat there and he's like basically scrubbing you, like, now we're going to delete that news or whatever. They're trying to essentially prevent that. Um, and it seems like a really awesome idea, really cool. I love the idea. Uh, and obviously, I, I had a look at the uh, the, the company Litecoin, um, I think it's company. And yeah, I just, what I don't quite get on this side of things is like, they have their own coin, right? Like coin. Why? <laughs> like why, why does it need to have its own token? <laughs> I, I know why, obviously, but like. It, <laughs> I was, I mean, that actually surprises me because like open timestamps exists. Um, and, and even if you, even if you don't know open timestamps, stamps exists, like proof of existence stuff is, like I mean, it's very, it's it's been done. It's been done for nearly a decade on blockchain, and what what is really really fascinating is the proof of existence stuff predates blockchain. I mean, do people do people honestly think that the first time anyone thought, hey, if only there was an immutable record that this file existed at this point in time, was after Bitcoin existed? So I mean, there's they are actually timestamping services that exist and have existed for a very long time that do this professionally, that distribute the record, they do all of that and, uh, and will even store the original file for you. And you can go back and it's, it's recognized in court, by the way, you can actually bring this up in court. I don't think proof of existence on a blockchain has been tested in court yet. Um, so none of this stuff is new. It's, uh, you know, but why it's odd to me that they'd want to create a separate token for it, unless it's for self enrichment, which is frustrating. It's probably the truth, right, as well. I, this is the thing, like, I, I thought, okay, great. Because I remember when I was doing, like, my, uh, I did, like, a, a blockchain and crypto course, like, years back when I was trying to learn about, you know, Bitcoin and understand what, you know, what it was. And um, they were talking about exactly that, right, proof of existence and how, you know, you could use blockchain for that and blah, 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 and how it'd been done. Um, and I thought, okay, this is cool that, like, a group of people potentially in Hong Kong were getting together to specifically try and do it for Hong Kong as, like, an area because of all the political issues and stuff. I thought, okay, that's a great idea. They're all teaming together to get this on to, but then I just realized, you know, as you, as you say, it's like, not only has it been done before, okay, them doing it differently, fine. But then it's like, you've got this token uh, that doesn't, I, there's no, I, as far as I can tell, there's no real use for the token other than to just profit from the situation basically, uh, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but I say the, the idea of Hong Kong you know, specifically doing this is quite, is quite cool, I, I would have thought. This project, I'm not familiar with this Hong Kong project other than you bringing it up in, in, in this article, Lawrence, but this project kind of sounds like um, the True News blockchain that Preeti Kassaridi was working on that kind of failed miserably. And she ended up actually having to give all the ICO money that she raised back to the investors because the project was such a failure. So um, I, I don't have a whole lot of optimism about this project. No, it's fair. Um... Yeah. Yeah, I think I think projects like this have a very short uh, um, lifetime or lifespan because there yeah, is basically no they usually get no traction and um, and the token you know kind of essence as an extra layer of barrier to the use you know, to the utility being able to use the platform in it itself. So imagine you being able to use the platform. They say, oh, for you to use the platform, you have to get the token on X exchange and withdraw them. You know put on the platform before you can access the platform and it, all that complexities and it's basically you know it it makes the whole you know horrible user experience and i think that is going to be the nail on its own coffin yeah i mean as i say i think so that what i mean what i'm getting at i think the uh you know the, the idea of doing so uh and people trying to do so is is awesome obviously i guess like you know i i think wanting to prevent um a, a, a government from essentially altering and removing history is pretty important but um as you guys are saying this is where my my issues kind of rang in was like well what's going to make this succeed and them having a token and their own specifically tailor-made blockchain it just seems like a bunch of crap so um that was my conclusion from reading it um but it sounds like everyone here kind of agrees <laughs> on, on that level um but yeah I, jerry have you got any news you want to bring up or are you uh are you all good to move on to you know the most important part of the podcast yeah please let's move on i really want to hear what uh, fluffy has to say 
Okay, awesome. All right. Well, as I say, uh, this is the bit where we've been waiting for ourselves. So, uh, yeah, we'll move on from discussing the news um, and we won't do a game or anything either um, because, you know, there's more important things. Um, so we can talk to Ricardo, like a pony. Um, and, uh, yeah, basically bombard you with uh, our questions we've wanted to ask you uh, <laughs> about uh, multiple different things. Um, bombard away. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, first one being, can I get Atari waffle? No, I'm joking. But the Atari waffle makers, by the way, <laughs> awesome. I was looking at these the other day, and uh, yeah, I ended up getting some some diaries instead because they were the only one of the only things left. But um, that is the coolest uh, merch I've seen in quite a long time. I have to I have to give you props there. Um, but yeah, first actual question I've got for you. Um, so yeah, I guess this is something I was thinking about when it comes to like the uh, the cryptocurrency world. Uh, you've done quite a lot already, um, considering the industry is basically just over a decade old, arguably. Um, and first off, you're still contributing to the Monero project, um, and you were previously the lead maintainer of that project. Um, but yeah, if you can like take a, a trip down memory lane, um, I guess it'd be interesting to hear um, your side or your thoughts and or your explanation on like how not only like how you discovered Monero, but like what was it that specifically made you dedicate like a chunk of your time and life to it? Like, I guess what clicked for you yeah. that made you think this is it, like this is what I want to do? So I guess a combination of things, you know, the, the first is um, like I'd, I'd been in Bitcoin since I first started playing with Bitcoin in May 2011. Um, and Monero came on the scene uh, early 2014 um and what attracted me to it was like oh cool it's, you know it's got a got an anonymous founder that's great you know that's always a, a good starting point um the cryptography was extremely interesting to me uh, because it wasn't bitcoin it was you know a different elliptic curve it was a uh, it was still there were still many things that that it inherited from bitcoin it's like oh we're going to use transaction outputs we're going to use transaction inputs we've got proof of work there's all this stuff that's like um that that's that's similar to bitcoin but then it's like well and then we're going to turn it on its head and use like dual key stealth addresses and ring signatures and i was like mind blown at the same time it was also during this like weird part of um 2014 uh where like everything that listed on poloniex would pump and then dump and in and, and and like everyone myself included was we were like mining stuff that got released you'd like sit on bitcoin talk and you'd read all the the old coin threads and you'd be like Ooh, okay cool new thing getting released with this with x72 as the as the proof of work algorithm and you'd mine it for like the first couple of weeks and then you wait for it to list on poloniex and you dump it so so whilst whilst monero was interesting because it was different like my first thought was like, oh, cool, profit. You know, like I, I was not like, oh, privacy. It was all about like, oh, cool, another one that I can now mine and then dump it in its polo. And what I what I didn't factor into it was the fact that because Monero wasn't based on Bitcoin's code base, that actually adding it to anything, like any exchange was going to be a total nightmare. So like, of course I didn't, you know, you don't think about that. You're just like mine, 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 mine. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, ended up because of the, I mean, there were so many things. It didn't run properly on, uh, it, didn't, it didn't run on Mac a, at all. And, you know, like I was, I was uh, running a Mac um, as, you know, as well as all my, my mining machines. And so I was like, well, like, how do I get this thing working on Mac? And now we're on IRC and we're talking and we've got GitHub issues. And like the founder's a little bit aloof, but that's fine as a community, this like burgeoning nascent community is, uh, is, is appearing. And we're all discussing how to, you know, all these technical things. And we're finding all these interesting things out, not because it wasn't in the white paper, but because you're like digging into the code and you're like, oh, that's how that works. Oh, wow, look at that. That's really interesting. Um, and I kind of fell in love with, um, with, with, Monero uh, conceptually, but certainly with Monero as like this thing that that was just full of pain points, and and I mean I I'm a massive believer in just like having a good user experience, and that was I mean you cannot get a worse user experience than Monero at its outset, command line only only 
you know, like 90% of the time you're compiling it yourself because like no one's got binaries for your operating system. Like to really, really difficult, you know, which is not too dissimilar to Bitcoin in its early days. Um, although Bitcoin at least had a, had a, a very rudimentary GUI. Um, but it just, you know, it, it's like getting, having that project where it's like so rudimentary and no one's around to make it happen you know like i mean there's people who are around in the community but very few people were willing to actually go i can do that or i'm willing to do this you know you had a bunch of people pop up and they're like if you need translation into turkish i'll do it for a bounty it's like no bro we don't what we need is a gui and and like a you know a cli that doesn't suck um so so we you know like like i just i kind of inherited the role of lead maintainer it wasn't something that i set out to pursue like oh man i already want to lead an open source project it, it was something that just landed in my lap because the um the the guy who who launched uh, monero thankful for today like within a few weeks he started being just uh, like impossible to deal with and like the community wanted to go a certain way on a very critical point he wanted to go another way and he refused to listen to what the community did. We even made it made a vote uh, voting system, a minor voting system, where miners would vote using the, the block version. Um, and the, the vote was like not in his favor. And he was still like, well, you know, I'm just gonna do it anyway. It's like, okay, bro, the community doesn't want it. The miners don't want it. Like, what are you doing? And that was the point at which I was like, okay, we need to fork this away from him. And myself and six others did. And I ended up being the de facto lead maintainer because no one else wanted to. Yeah, because I read about that, like kind of that like, sort of power struggle, I guess you could put it between the guy and um, who, who, who like read. Because I was, am I right in saying I could be completely wrong here? Um, but am I right in saying it was the white paper was written by someone else, and then yes, the, thankful today picked it up. He wrote the initial, and then obviously then it was split, and his fork obviously just died out pretty quickly because no one really gave a damn and obviously your guys one was what became monero now and obviously that's how you then fell into the, like the lead maintainer right um right okay gotcha i just exactly, want to make sure i wasn't completely telling people lies there but i thought it had been written by someone else and then uh you know the white paper etc was separate things um oh, that's pretty cool um and i guess uh well i guess so obviously that that explains like why and and how you ended up getting into into there because obviously as you said you paid around bitcoin and i think before you were like in the import business i think wasn't it i believe yeah so I've, i mean i started off as a developer being a developer um for for most of my life um eventually worked my way up to, to quite a senior role um and then uh in the sort of late 2000s um, I quit that to start an import export business with my wife. Gotcha. Okay. Right. Uh, and so obviously then, yes, yeah, so that explains, cause that was what I was trying to understand. I was like, well, damn. So I was like, cause I, when I read back, I didn't see that you'd been developing before. So I was like, so you had an import export business and they somehow like, you got oh, yeah. Bitcoin and yeah, then, no, no, <laughs> I, no, no, it definitely didn't transition that way. And even in the import export business, I like didn't know what I was doing on the import export side, but what I did know how to do is build systems. So, you know, we like right. built a bunch of e-commerce front end uh, stores for it. Um, and I built all of the systems to manage the, uh, the stock in the warehouse. Uh, and then to talk, like we had this whole EDI thing, um, electronic data interchange thing with uh, retailers. So we're bringing it in, it's in the warehouse. And then the retailer buyer says like, oh, we need 20 of those and 15 of these. And then you deliver it to, to their warehouse. And then everyone else was doing paperwork. It's like, you know, the guys are sitting there, the delivery guys are sitting there filling in paperwork while stuff gets counted. And I built this like EDI system where we just spoke to their systems and they would just bring it in as they brought it into their warehouse. It would just kick back to our system to say like, yes, we've now received all the goods and all the, the invoicing of that would be done automatically. And that blew their minds. They were just like, well, none of our other suppliers are doing that. So we're just going to buy a lot from you. And we're like, great. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it's always been developer centric. It's never really, um, I don't think I'm a particularly gifted business person or like really good at marketing or anything. I've always been more on the system side than anything else. Ricardo, I wanted to ask you, um, it seems like you've been involved in a lot of really interesting projects in the crypto sphere. What's the most interesting thing that's currently happening in the crypto sphere, in your opinion? That is a really hard question to answer. <laughs> um, so, you know, 
you know, there's a there, there's an interesting dynamic playing out. Um, and and this might be a very unpopular opinion, but you know, I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I think that what Ethereum has created is really interesting because I have Ethereum's total garbage, and I have a like, I, you know I have a laundry list of issues with Ethereum. But what it has created is an environment where you can be a JavaScript developer who was doing, you know, Shopify websites yesterday, and today you're a smart contract developer. And and so there have been a, there's just been a string of um, of innovation of on, you know, in terms of projects being built on, on Ethereum. And there's also been a string of, of just mess, right? I mean, like 99% of it is mess. And then there's this 1% where I'm like, wow, that's actually really cool. Um, and, uh, and that does not, by any means mean that 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 one percent is well architected um you know well thought through or anything like that but it just there is there is definitely a slither of interesting stuff being done and what i'm finding really interesting is like the 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 projects that are now spinning up um in the bitcoin space and elsewhere uh that are saying like that are recognizing the same thing they're like oh wow that's really interesting what if we did it properly I don't know. What if we did it in a scalable and secure way? Wouldn't that be interesting? Um, so, so from my perspective, some of the most interesting things that are being done right now are um, not just not necessarily DeFi uh, per se, but like interesting approaches to decentralized uh, projects, interesting approaches to decentralized governance, um, and then taking the the concept, the idea, and saying, let's do it. But let's do it in a scalable, secure way. Let's do it with uh, with secure, defensive programming practices instead of writing it in JavaScript. And and that to me is fascinating, even more fascinating than Lightning, which I absolutely love. The Open Zeppelin uh, Ethereum Remix thing, where anybody can deploy a smart contract without a code, is is kind of interesting, in my opinion. Yeah, I guess like this is part of like uh, when I first got into crypto, what I was so amazed by is like the ideas that people are having, like some of the stuff that people are coming up with. And um, and now, uh, even in the last like week, I've started thinking like I hear about some altcoin project and I think, well, that's an awesome idea. How can you make take that and do it on Bitcoin or, or use Bitcoin to do it? That's like, well, I've started thinking more and more as I go less from altcoins and <laughs> become more of a Bitcoiner over time, uh, which has definitely happened to me in the last year or so. But it's a really good point you raised. Like there's some cool ideas is how can we take that and actually use it and make it actually a success and, and well built uh, i guess i, I had um a question um and i guess i'm kind of i'm flying back to the monero side of things again but obviously uh sorry yeah we're going we're gonna go back and forth from time scales because i'm <laughs> ricardo and i have totally fine to ask. um but yeah so i guess i yeah I, i've got like an understanding of like how you obviously you arrived at, at, at bitcoin and then at monero because obviously of, of things i've read in the past and obviously what you've explained as well which is filled in a gap in my knowledge there so i was imagining like okay this guy's doing import export and suddenly he like learns to code somewhere like afterwards i'm like how has he done this this is genius so i get it now i understand the, the background and why um so like obviously you you, you worked as the lead maintainer on monero um, for quite some time and obviously helped essentially shape it build it to what it is now um what what is it the um what is it that specifically, I guess, or uh, there might be a, a multitude of things, but what is it primarily that made you think, I'm going to sort of maybe step back from this and move on to other things? Was it, I mean, go ahead and tell, I'm not going to guess, but you know, what, what, what was it? What was it that did that? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, obviously, you know, going back to sort of Monero's um, inception and, and that whole community takeover, our hostile takeover, um, the, the trick or the challenge in any new open source project, and especially one where something like that has happened, is there aren't a lot of resources. So you've got a growing community, um, but there aren't a lot of people that are, are that have the time, the energy, sometimes even the money to go and and to do certain things. And I'll give you an example. Um, it's like, okay, cool. We've you know we've we've got a domain, we want to put a website up. So we need a server for that. Who's going to pay for the server, you know, and then who's going to set the server up. Um, okay. Nowadays you're doing Netlify or whatever, but back in the day, <laughs> who's going to set the server up, who's going to harden it so that it doesn't get hacked, you know, who's going to do all of this stuff. And so a lot of the time that fell on me again, not because I was like an expert Linux administrator or, you know, like I was, really good at finding the best server but just because i was available and because i was i had the time and i was able to and 
if you fast forward five years, now you, you sort of get to, to sort of 2019, 2018, 2019, and, uh, and now the, the situation's reversed. Now you've got a massive community. You've got a million people who have been around for a long time, who you can rely on, who can take over um, the stuff, who have the money to pay for the server. There's, you know, donations. There's all of that. There's no longer constraints. So why is the stuff still falling on me? You know, that's bad. That's that me. That makes me a bus factor. Um, and uh, and so we needed to start myself and and uh, and some of the guys um, part, that are part of like the Monero core team who effectively all we do is just um, we're the ones who own the GitHub and the domains. It's kind of all we do. We don't make any decisions, but just like that, they have to live with someone. We were like, how do we how do we make sure that this is further decentralized? You know, so making sure that like multiple people have access to the domain infrastructure, uh, multiple trusted people who've been in the community for the, since its inception have access to that. Um, you know, the two, like, like we've got really extensive two-factor authentication on everything. We've got a relationship with the registrar. We've got all of that. Um, same goes for like, you know, for the GitHub stuff. Like, why should I be the one um, or, or myself and like one other person or two other people, why should we be the ones dictating who has access to certain things? You know, so, so it really came down to how do we decentralize stuff more than anything. That was the primary driver. And I've been trying to decentralize myself um, in, in terms of my roles within the Mirror project since like 2017. So that, you know, taking a step back as lead maintainer was the kind of the final step in making sure I'm no longer the linchpin, I'm no longer the bus factor. Um, and then of course that, you know, at the same time I was building other stuff. So it gave me the opportunity to work on, on other things. Gotcha. Okay. So it's like the final piece of the puzzle to make, you know, the project a success essentially, I guess, in your eyes, which, uh, which yeah, makes sense. Uh, absolutely. So, you know, in some ways um, I would say that Bitcoin was, Bitcoin was somewhat held back um, until Gavin stepped back as maintainer because Gavin had, had also like, I, I think he was a reluctant maintainer, maybe not so much, but, but partially a reluctant maintainer because Satoshi had chosen him and had given him, given him access. Uh, and he might not have been the best fit for the job at all. Um, I think Vladimir is an excellent maintainer, you know, flies under the radar and, um, and uh, and just knuckles down and, and does his job. And frankly, I think is also a, a significantly better developer than uh, than Gavin, which is something you need in, in that role. Um, so, you know, the same with, with Monero. Monero, I don't think Monero was curtailed with, with me as, main, as maintainer, um, but it definitely, it, it needed to, it needed me to step back so that others can fill the void. Um, and uh, and that's what's happened, and it's worked out really well for Monero. Nice, no, I, I appreciate that. That's, uh, thanks for the uh, explanation. Uh, makes sense. I wanted to ask you: Do you think that the increased dark web adoption of Monero uh, puts Monero at risk to be stigmatized that only terrorists and criminals use it? Like the same narrative they were trying to use to discredit Bitcoin. You know, I mean, it certainly is a fear I have that um, that that it's going to be viewed. Uh, not not viewed. It's going to be portrayed in a negative right, light by the the media. At the same time, you know, Bitcoin's Bitcoin took a few years and outgrew that. And I, maybe maybe it takes Monero, you know, five or six years to outgrow um, any sort of media coverage like that. I do think that the 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 way that the media has fetishized, is that even a word? Um, the, uh, it's probably not, but I'm making it a word now. But, but the way that they've, they've, uh, they've turned an obsession with the dark web into a fetish for, for them is really appalling because frankly, the dark web is not even that interesting. Like, you know, what, what, the, what a lot of the media gets wrong is they're like, on the dark web, you can hire an assassin. And what you actually hire is someone who takes your Bitcoin 
and then sends you a screenshot from a TV series and says, there, I've killed him. And you go, oh, cool. And then meanwhile, the dude's totally still alive and you've been scammed. Like, obviously, scammers are going to go there because they're being paid in like, you know, untraceable, irreversible currency. Why would they not go and scam you there? It's the best possible place. Also, because you're buying illegal stuff, you're not going to go to the cops and be like, oh, I try to pay for an assassination and, you know, the guy didn't deliver. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a report for the on the better business bureau it's not acceptable worst assassin ever you know like, it's like it's like the perfect crime like why do people not realize this and the dark web is literally 99 percent scams and then like one percent people buying weed because they can't get it anywhere else like it's it's not interesting at all um, and it certainly does not work that the way uh, the way that TV series and movie writers think it works, and it doesn't work that the the way that most um, most journalists think it works. And there are don't get me wrong, there's some really really excellent journalists that are actually that do cover the dark web. Andy Greenberg, um, is, is, you know, is one of them who has actually dug into it has has you know gone and browsed on the dark web he's probably bought a bunch of weed i don't know um or at least tried to it's probably been scammed you know and and he actually knows how the thing works um so you do get some journalists who cover this stuff uh, very seriously and or have covered it in the past um and understand how it works um i think that as we progress, hopefully journalists and the media and TV series writers stop this this fetish over this obsession over the dark web because they already are. I mean, I'm I'm seeing less and less of it um, in uh, in TV series. They're going back to their their old ways of like, and then the terrorists communi communicated using chat in a game. And I'm like, yes, because that's app. They wouldn't use Signal or Wire or anything. They would totally use a game that's untraceable. Um, <laughs> and uh, and they're using they they're going back to their old tropes and they're starting to leave the dark web tropes a little bit, which is great. Um, you know, less obsession from journalists on it as well. Um, uh, no one, I, I'm I've not seen much in the way of like mainstream media coverage over um, stuff like uh, darknet markets going down and being replaced and anything like that. So, you know, I think that that's, that that's probably good because it means that they've realized that it's actually significantly smaller and significantly less interesting, I'd argue, than the actual criminal underground that does stuff like sex trafficking and all sorts and actual assassinations and all sorts of other things. And they use cash, you know, or gold or diamonds um, and they do things in person, not over the internet, hidden in someone's mom's basement. So it's, uh, you know, that that's sort of where we where we're at. And I think that makes Monero's Monero very interesting to privacy advocates, and a lot less interesting to screenwriters who need a plot device in a movie. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. What you say about the the, the dark web, deep web, whatever is like uh, mirroring my discovery when I was like, I can't remember how I would have been fourteen, fifteen, whatever. I'm like, oh wow, this sounds so cool. I'm gonna go find this. Yeah, download tour, and then it was just like the disappointment when I got in there. I thought, yeah, this is actually a mess. Like nothing's indexed, and it's actually quite hard to find anything. And it all looks like yeah. really scammy. Like as if I'm yeah. gonna get like a, a MacBook that fell off a truck for like ten pounds. Like oh, it, the it, MacBook. The MacBook that fell off a truck <laughs> thing on the hidden wiki. I remember seeing that and I was like, oh man, this is so cool. You'll be able. And then I thought about it and I was like, that's not real, is it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it takes, people are getting scammed. It takes like 10 seconds, doesn't it? To think, oh, actually, wait a second. Like, how am I going to, how am I going to, this is not happening, is it? It's like they're, they're gaining nothing by saying this to me. They should just go, they could go on Facebook's, you know, marketplace and sell it for cash to someone and it would probably be better for them. But um, yeah, it was, um, yeah, quite a discovery, I guess. Uh, but yeah. if you point, yeah, you raise. And it's like, uh, as you say, film and TV, they get obsessed with something, don't they? Like, I remember when I was growing up, it was always about games. Like, you know, they had that manhunt, whatever it was, and how this is children are going to kill each other, and this is the sole cause or whatever. And uh, <laughs> it's always this stuff they fixate on. Or you get, like, uh, with films, it's like a lot of stuff is just, it's just like, uh, yeah, you can whack someone around the back of the head, and they're going to be fine. It just knocks them out for a little period of time. That's using yes. every film in existence. No, no concussion at yeah. all. No need to go to the hospital 
hospital. Nothing, no death. But in reality, it's you can't just go bonk, bonk, and then just. But anyway, yeah, it's. Uh, I think you got it right there with the the dark web narrative and stuff like that from the media. Uh Bugado, First of all, that I have to you know applaud your honesty, especially when you said that you you, you got into Monero because you were trying to make money. Um, did <laughs> did you have any you know prior interest in you know, privacy you know in any way you know before you got into Monero? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So I mean, like before Monero even existed, um, uh, I've been a, a long time um, fan of Tor and of ITP in particular, um, mostly because I have always had concerns over like my personal privacy and you know the like I, I spend a lot of time compartmentalizing between stuff that I'm happy being public and stuff that is private between myself, my wife, my family, whatever. Uh, I think people struggle with that. You know, they post pictures of their children on public Instagram profiles and you know then they're surprised when like there's a kidnapping or something they're like oh how did they even know we were at the park well because you posted a picture of you at the park five seconds ago you live streamed it i mean like what do you expect so you know i've i've always had this like me- ability to mentally compartmentalize it and uh, and my wife and i um, have been big big proponents of that you know you, this is the stuff that we uh, we're happy being public this is the stuff that we're not and so privacy technology is kind of an extension of that you know when i'm chatting with people in the industry about random nonsense i'm happy to do it on telegram when i'm messaging my wife or my parents or my sister or anyone in my family i'm doing it on wire as much as they hate wire and are like oh it's so painful to use can we use whatsapp no we can't we're not using whatsapp we're using wire um and uh, and so that that you know take the technology sort of lends itself towards that um also, before Monero existed, I uh, was a, you know, I worked on a non-coin, which was kind of the first attempt at like doing some privacy stuff. That was, uh, I mean, it was a fork of Bitcoin, and uh, unfortunately, ended up largely being disinteresting. Um, but at the time, there was, you know, lots of really interesting stuff that we were trying to do. Um, you know, hooking a non-coin into I2P um, was was the one thing, but then actually you know adding stealth addresses and that was the other um so yeah like before before monero came around i had a a big interest in it um and uh and monero was kind of monero did did to some degree flip a switch and force me to double down and to really dig into um not only like the the social aspects of it like why is privacy so important um who does privacy help who does it hurt why why is the default f- for designers and, and developers not privacy first you know why why is everyone just like oh let's capture all the information that'll totally be fine you know thinking through a lot of these these issues and then of course the tech the technological stuff you know thinking through very arcane very difficult to execute attacks if you're a nation state and you want to have access to privacy enhancing systems like on a broad scale how do you do that well you know you form an industry body like nist and uh, and then you you indicate you know which um uh pieces of cryptography you recommend and you do that because you have this information arbitrage you know you you have uh, total information asymmetry where you know which pieces of, of cryptography are weak. And so you can make recommendations um, to, to the world to use things that are broken in subtle ways that only you know about, which NIST has done in the past. And I think they've gotten better, but still, you know, like understanding why certain, um, certain choices are, are viewed by section of the cryptography community as being bad even though at face value they seem to be good you know certain elliptic curve choices and so on it's all about those subtle breaks that traditionally 
uh, a, a lot of nation states have tried to, and industry bodies have tried to plaster over. And you look at that and you're like, wow, the, that is a really subtle class of attacks that that people don't often recognize or understand. They're just like, oh, I'm using math.random in JavaScript. This will totally be fine. Gotcha. It's like privacy is like a battle is the way I always think of it. Like there's always yeah. a constant battle with privacy and I think there always will be um and that's been since before the internet realistically i mean that's uh, yeah and what and what what technology is really created is you know in fact that battle analogy is really good because a lot of the attacks that that i think of that that i ideate on um and think about ways to prevent are not the the ones that you might expect you know if you're if you've got an actual battle between two armies like yes they can run at each other in on an open battlefield and and shoot and tank drop drop bombs and shoot with tank guns and all that stuff you can see i'm a military person with all my technical terms um <laughs> but but how most battles aren't fought that way most battles are you know there's like the front lines where they're mostly shooting around each other not at each other and a lot of the the actual uh, battle is uh, is one through all sorts of subversive means you know there's intelligence and counterintelligence you know, spies and then other spies on the other side trying to gain all this information. Um, and then they do all this subversive stuff, you know, like um, in like in World War II um, where, and World War I as well, where they dropped pamphlets. They made fake pamphlets um, to try and dishearten the, the side, the opposing side. And then they drop all these pamphlets from a plane. Um, and then you pick up the pamphlets and then you, you know, the pamphlet seems to be produced by your side. And meanwhile, it's like total propaganda designed to to dishearten you. And if and I mean, like, what a subtle way of attacking the soldiers and their families. You know, like so clever in a very wicked and evil way. Because if 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 a soldier doesn't if a soldier is disheartened and doesn't want to fight, then that's going to carry through, and they're going to end up not being as adept, not being as, as good. Um, and that's how you lose the battle. So, you know, in, in a very real way with, uh, with privacy technology, it's not like no one's sitting there trying to brute force Monero private keys. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to attack things in a far more subtle way. And that's really, I think, where, where it's, it becomes very interesting. Since you're bringing up attacks on Monero, I wanted to ask you, what impact does Cypher Trace's Monero tracing software have? And how do you feel about US tax authorities offering a bounty for software developers to create software to try to deprivatize yeah. Monero? So, so Cypher Trace's stuff is total garbage. Um, it's a visual block explorer that makes a bunch of guesses. The, the CEO even tweeted out that no one can, um, something like no one can objectively um, trace Monero. Um, it's, you know, like, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate, oh yeah, no one can deterministically trace Monero transactions. That's the, the CEO of Cypher Trace. If you can't deterministically trace Monero transactions, then congratulations, you've built the electronic version of a roll the dice game. You know, like you, it's like you're, you're basically, you're basically just, guessing and well a human can do that probably better than a computer um because your the information set is not big enough um so so that is kind of not a concern um i think the irs is also kind of defocused you know like they want to they want people to pay their taxes at this point in time and, and i would imagine that even for the foreseeable future no one is earning monero and then paying their rent in Monero and then buying a Ferrari in Monero. That's just not happening. So nothing is happening outside of, of the traditional financial system. Um, and at some point you're going into some sort of traceable thing where whether it is a US dollar CBDC, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's um, you know a normal dollars in your bank account, at some point you've got to break into that system in order to pay your rent buy a house, buy a Ferrari, do whatever you want. And so it's pretty easy for the IRS to be able to see uh, and gather information to know whether or not you're, uh, you're, you're doing that. But even if, even if we lived in this hypothetical uh, world where 
everyone was using Monero. You were actually, uh, you know, getting paid in Monero. You were buying a house in Monero. You were buying a car in Monero with Monero. Even in that world, the IRS still has lifestyle audits. You know, they're still able to figure out whether or not you're, you've actually paid um, the, the correct amount of tax. And they can do it relatively trivially. You know, they can just like drive past your house and be like, wow, that's an eight bedroom mansion. And you claim to only earn a thousand dollars a month. Hmm. You know, and, and really the analog is if you go back in history, at what point was the IRS able to trace things electronically? The eighties, maybe I would say probably the nineties, they started really getting a handle on being able to trace people's uh, financial transactions electronically. So are you telling me that before like the nineties, the IRS was totally unable to enforce tax regulation? Well, that makes no sense. I mean, obviously they were able to. So, you know, how, oh, well, you know, traditional methods like your neighbor, um, uh, you know, getting audited and the IRS auditor looks over the yard and says, huh, that's weird that the guy's got tall Ferraris in the, in the garden. You know, like, I mean, it's, it's uh, these methods exist and, and there's no need to even trace Monero. So I think, um, I think that there's just the problem is they've had so much visibility on people's transactions that they've been spoiled. And now they're like, wow, we need that for everything. We, we need that for Monero. We can't live without it, which is not the case. And I think that they're going to end up realizing that eventually. I hope so anyway. Yeah, the fear is the, it's interesting because like it's like the the government's like ability to control or, or their abilities have grown so massively with the internet that suddenly to have something taken away it feels like you're kind of going whoa straight back in like archaic times of the 70s or whatever it's like so much yes, it feels like the archaic times where we wrote <laughs> checks out and and posted them in the mail yeah so that's kind of what it feels like um to me uh i guess i got to, well i've got a question but um i am yeah, where we're kind of uh, closing in on on the end of, a, of the podcast so I'll, I'll i'll pop it to you now though um just so you can uh can talk about it quickly um yeah obviously you're the you're the co-founder of um the merge mind monero sidechain to tari labs right um essentially is what one of the things you're working on as well as yeah um I mean, uh, well, uh, two questions since we're since I want to squeeze this in uh, with Tari. Uh, I just appreciate if you could give like an explanation of like what's going on there, like what you're trying to achieve, just for our audience purpose. Um, and then once you've done that uh, with 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 Yat or Y dot, I don't know how to say it yet. But um, with that, uh, I just I'd just be interested to hear because obviously that's pretty simple in in what it is, right? Like it's uh, at its core, it's just you know an emoji string that it becomes your unique identity, or whatever online that you can then link to. So how wh where did that idea come from? Because it's quite like a fun, unique kind of different thing essentially. So I just wanted to hear an answer to those two questions basically. Um, sure. So, um, so Tari is a, a decentralized assets protocol. So, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, um, I guess, a spiritual uh, sister to Counterparty, which, you know, was built on top of Bitcoin. And this is built um, on top of Monero. Um, uh, you know, so it's merge mind with Monero, and uh, and one of the things that we that that one of the beliefs that we have at Tari Labs is um, that the user experience needs to be excellent, and that's kind of what led to to uh, me inventing Yat was this whole idea of like how do we get away from the very terrible user experience that is like. Bitcoin and Monero and whatever addresses, they're really bad. And, uh, and so I ended up like with this idea of couldn't we use emojis? And, uh, and that's what we've done in Tari, you know, your Tari address is a 33 emoji long thing, which, you know, is a full 256 bit private uh, public key rather, um, 32 characters for the public key and then a, an extra character for uh, the checksum. And it uses a restricted emoji set to prevent phishing attacks and all sorts of stuff. Um, and then we did that and we were like, um, you know, well, wouldn't it be much better if it was only a smaller number of emojis? And the only way to do that is an, is an aliasing system. So we built this aliasing system called YAT uh, I mean, it wasn't called YAT at the time, it was called Emoji ID, but then we, we called it YAT because we realized as we were building this that it can do more than just be your Bitcoin address. You know, it's, it's between one and five emojis, but it could also exist in other things. It could just be like a, a website 
URL. You know, um, I mean, why does it, a website have to be .com or whatever? What if it was just a bunch of emojis? And you put in these emojis, again, restricted set to prevent phishing attacks and, and homoglyph, homoglyph attacks. Um, but, but then you put in these emojis and it's like, oh, cool, you know, like, uh, here's the website, my website, or here's my, like, um, uh, list of links or whatever, you know, anything that you want. Um, and then what else can it do? You know, oh, well, what if it was also a physical location on Earth, you know? Um, like, it, like a set of emojis could do all of this. Um, and the set is so big, I mean, not the set, but the namespace is so big that, um, especially when you get into four or five emojis, um, that you can use them ephemerally. You know, if you want to have a yacht for the next two days because you're traveling and you need to be able to, like, give it out to people or receive payments or whatever, you can, and then you can turf it and never use it again. So that was re that's really the idea. Um, and at the same time, you can also build one that is like shorter and, um, and obviously significantly uh, something that you might want to build a longer lived identity around. So these are all, these are all things that have come about as a result of, of Yat's existence. Gotcha. I appreciate, uh, yeah, appreciate the uh, explanation there of like the links between the two actually, which uh, I hadn't expected there to be like such a close link between the two. So that's quite cool um there is yeah there's, there's many more questions i have but i won't i won't ask as uh, i was saying where we're we're clocking in on uh, towards an hour so um yeah i mean i obviously as i said uh, we'll, we'll do like uh, our standard uh, good news uh, outro where we kind of just give people a positive burst before they uh, they leave and hopefully leave them with a happy day happy week um but I, before i do that i, I say i really appreciate uh, you taking the time out to to do this podcast with us it's been awesome uh, you've been a fantastic guest and uh, I, yeah, I really appreciate your insight on quite a few different things there um, that I had the high questions on. And uh, I'm sure the same could be said for Ricardo and Jerry. Um, so here comes the good news. Uh, a phase three trial of MDMA therapy for severe PTSD is so successful that 67% of the participants don't even qualify for diagnosis of PTSD now. Rubber, which has been made from dandelions, is helping to make tires more sustainable. COVID lockdowns have shown signs of improving children's reading skills as they have spent more time reading and more difficult books. The area of forests which have been regrown since the year 2000 covers the size of France. A food tech startup in upstate New York has developed technology to preserve food without refrigeration for months beyond when it would normally spoil without the use of any artificial preservatives. And lastly, a teenager in the US signed a tenancy agreement on an apartment without viewing it and has ended up living in a retirement village. And it turns out that the rent is cheap, her neighbors are quiet and friendly, and she plans to stay for a while. That one was, uh, I just thought it was quite funny. I thought how she messed that up. Um, but there you go. So that was uh, that was our good news. Um, and yeah, as I said before, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, it was it was awesome. Uh, and thank you to the listeners for listening in. And uh, yeah, very much appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This was great. Brilliant. Well, no worries. Take care. And uh, to all the listeners out there, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> Bye. Bitcoin. Bitcoin.